I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Did a little experiment today. I did a podcast on Twitter space, had on Nobel Prize loser Brian Keating, Famously known for writing the book, Losing the Nobel Prize. He, he actually is the smartest person I know. Almost did win the Nobel Prize, and maybe he will win it. What did we talk about? We talked about everything except physics. Although I did try to pitch him my grand theory unifying all of physics, but he would have none of it. Here's Brian. So, so Brian, I just read this interesting article. It has nothing to do with physics, but mm -hmm. I just read it. So I want to tell you and, and yeah. Jay about it. It, it. It's an article someone sent me about real estate, which basically says BlackRock is buying every house they can find in the country and paying 20 to 50% more than the asking price for as many houses as they can. There's so many different interesting things that come out of that financially. One is they view real estate as an interesting investment now, more interesting than other investments. And I'm, I'm curious if they're buying in New York, but I think they're buying in all the places that are people are leaving New York and LA and San Francisco to go to. The other is, are they making a statement about inflation? Because real estate goes up. It's, it's basically an inflation event when real estate goes up. And with all this money printing, maybe they're, this is their hedge against inflation. But the third most insidious thing is they get money from the Federal Reserve is it dangerous that they're basically getting money from the taxpayer and from all this federal printing? You know, they, they have an open window to the Federal Reserve. They're basically taking money from the taxpayer and then screwing the taxpayer out of buying a home because they're overpaying 20 to 30% on every home. So on the one hand, they're doing it their job, making a good investments by buying every house they can find and they think that's a good investment. But on the other hand, are they using taxpayer money to screw all the taxpayers? by overpaying for everybody's house and, and, and squeezing out all the people who want to buy homes? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question. But, you know, once I, I asked, uh, I was talking to one of my friends who's, who happens to be a rabbi and had to do with something, you know, some holiday was coming up and it, and it you know, most holidays in Judaism are on like, uh, you know, new moons or, or, you know, full moons or whatever. And I said, you know, when's the full moon? He goes, you're the astronomer asking me. You know, like, <laughs> I feel like you're the uh, former hedge fund, you know, investment manager, you know, one who called the new, you know, uh, all, all the all the housing crisis, all these crises. Bitcoin predicted Bitcoin in 2010. Where were you when I needed you back then, James? Okay, I have no idea. I, but, I know about a different kind of inflation. So where's yeah, the physics? Then, then yes, I the can go. cosmic inflation. But I am challenging your assumptions about what <laughs> implies credibility. Like mm. I am not a, I don't have a PhD in econ economics, mm -hmm. and yes, I've been an investor for a while, but I am notoriously bad at buying a house. In fact, I've written several times about how I don't 
uh, like to own homes. And now here's the, one of the best investors on the planet, uh, buying homes while we're, you know, the headlines are all about inflation, but I'm just wondering about the fact that they get money from the federal reserve to some extent, and they get easy lending policies and they could borrow infinite amount of money, but they're using the taxpayer money and they're pricing everybody out of owning a home. And, and by the way, their biggest investors are the Chinese. So <laughs> I'm just wondering what is, what is happening here at a political level? But they, right now, after you just said that, I'm challenging your assumption that you should, that you're implying you should stay in your lane and talk just about physics. Cause that's where your PhD is. And you almost won the Nobel prize in physics and probably will at, at some point, I am challenging the assumption that you could be an expert in whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, what's so funny to me is to think, you know, right now I have been challenging a lot of assumptions. You know, right now there's been a lot of talk in the news about uh, about UFOs and aliens and the and uh, the Pentagon release that's about to come up. And our mutual friend Eric Weinstein, <clears throat> maybe I should ping him to come in the room and listen. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he's he's really quite quite upset about these uh, phenomena, these unexplained phenomena. Like, like what unexplained phenomena? I mean, there's there's that case last year where the pilots have a video, you know, defend, you know, army pilots have this video of some mysterious object speeding away from them in a coordinated way, but much faster than they could ever possibly hope. It, it, it was the first time the Pentagon admitted this was a UFO, meaning an unidentified flying object, not necessarily aliens, but they couldn't identify a flying object, which is the real uh, meaning. There's Avi Loeb's semi-proof that what we saw floating through the asteroid belt or whatever was uh, this Umamua ship for aliens. Easy for you to say. You know, they have a real trouble pronouncing Altucher. I know. Altucher. I'm an it's expert at pronouncing hard names. <laughs> uh, so exactly, yeah. There is this kind of, uh, in the zeitgeist, in the ghostly, uh, ghost or spirit of the times, there seems to be this percolation of interest that's suffusing the media and in particular the narratives on and offline that perhaps there is a uh, first contact, whether it is a alien techno signatures, which would be, you know, a actual identifiable craft coming from another civilization, or as Avi perhaps maintained, uh, and again, he's not a crackpot, he's not a crank, he's not a lunatic, he's the former chairman of the Harvard University, a small college in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as I understand it, Harvard University's astronomy department, uh, you know, an eminent, eminent person. Um, and uh, and he claims this is, you know, perhaps this is the, the treatise, this is a garbage barge or, you know, something from an alien civilization, not in our solar system. So this is in the news, and uh, but this is not just last year. This goes back, the first initial encounters that started to make the rounds a couple of years ago uh, were from 2004 off the coast of San Diego, where I am now. Two Navy pilots in F-18 Super Hornets were flying around and over the course of several days got reports and made contact with uh, objects that they later described as Tic Tacs, giant Tic Tacs, uh, about the size of a school bus uh, that were submerged, churning the water and then speeding away, you know, at, at supersonic speeds without making a sound, without making a disturbance, with no visible means of propulsion. Do we have, do we have video of that? Like, how do we know that's true? No, we have eyewitness reports. We have radar signatures. Uh, we have, um, we have, in some cases, we have um, infrared camera data. Uh, but what's, what's so interesting, you know, I'm the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics here at UC San Diego. Anomalies. Oh, I thought you were say you're going to be that you, I, as you know, I'm the professor of aliens. At <laughs> UC, I thought that's what you were going to say. I told you uh, I had an exciting announcement to make, James. Yes, uh, no, sure. but I'm also the Arthur C. Clarke uh, Center for Human Imaginations co-director here, and Arthur C. Clarke uh, had many famous aphorisms and quips, and one of which was, "For every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert." So I want to ask you, James, is a pilot an expert? You know, in other words, if you say a pilot is an expert. Um, do you agree with that statement? You were talking about in you know these these Federal Reserve people as experts, and I want to dovetail into that and let's get into that conversation. Is a pilot an expert? Well, a pilot is certainly an expert at flying a plane, mm -hmm. and you can argue a pilot is an expert at spotting something unusual in their very unique frame of being thirty thousand feet above ground and what you could possibly see out of their window. So you can argue pilots are more used to what it looks like when you're 30,000 feet higher. So if they see something unusual for them, you know, if you think about it, statistics is a, is mathematical intuition. So whereas an expert uses intuition, somebody else can use statistics and come up with the same conclusion. 
So an expert can look at something and say, that's odd. And a statistician or, or a physics statistician like Avi Loeb from Harvard can say, this is what random behavior looks like. And this is what statistically significant behavior looks like. And this um, encounter with a flying object through space is statistically significantly not random. And so is it intuition? Are they experts? Or is it statistics can make you an expert? The answer is yes to all of them. You could have <laughs> intuition backed up by statistics, and then it's even better. So if these guys see something, and then you can look at the radar trail, and the radar trail says, yes, this is not a random movement like by a flock of birds or whatever, then, then that is something worth looking at. Right. So I just want to, uh, you know, uh, let people know we are on, not on Clubhouse, I'm used to saying that, we're on Twitter Spaces. This is James and I. We're doing experiments. So James and I are both into experiments. We're going to be talking, uh, this is James's podcast, actually, the James Altucher Show, on the one-year anniversary. I also want to point out, James, it's a kind of a bittersweet day for me. We'll get back into aliens, but today's the anniversary, the 15th anniversary of my father, James Axe, is passing away. And oh, as you know, he, yeah, well, you know, he is a huge uh, figure in my life, as you know, from my book. But, um, but I just want to recognize that fact and uh, take this opportunity to remind people of a certain age to get screened for cancer because, you know, when we hit 50 years old or so, you, your risk for cancer can really sneak up on you. And I want to take this opportunity, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind people in my father's memory, a beloved memory, to p please, you know, if you have any risk factors whatsoever, please take this opportunity to get screened. So I just wanted to recognize that. But but getting back to experts. Um, so yeah, so pilots are experts at flying. But one of the first, and I'm a private pilot, so I putt around in little Cessnas, not far away from where one of these, you know, spacecraft perhaps, or at least unidentified flying objects was spotted here in San Diego. And, uh, and, and you can fly through that area and not get shot down. It's called a warning area. It's not actually a forbidden area where, you know, you'll get uh, taken, escorted away to some secret room. But actually, it is a, uh, it's, it's permissible to fly. It's called a warning area. And in that area, uh, pilots can operate. And you're typically operating on what's called instruments. So one of the first lessons you get as a pilot is don't trust your senses. So you were making the case that, you know, pilots have expert, you know, abilities, maybe expert skills, which is true, and they have expert training. But one of the very first lessons you get is despite the tens of millions of dollars that these expert Navy pilots get, uh, that you may not rely on your senses. In fact, that's why you're trained to fly in reliance to your instruments and to your wingman or wingwoman. And, but uh, I, will, I will qualify what you're saying, and I always apologize mm -hmm. for interrupting. Yeah. But... That's because when you're in a plane and the plane has is is exerting some influence on the cabin pressure and so on, you really have no idea whether you're upside down or right side up or sideways or whatever. Your 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 brain is always going to think that you're flying straight ahead and you're you're upright. Whereas what your what your brain is telling you, what reality is is saying, might be different. But but this is a case where I'm saying, are, are you an expert at seeing objects? what sort of objects you would see outside your window at 30,000 feet. So that's right. slightly different than trusting your senses about whether you're upside down or not. Like if you're upside down, you could crash. So that's why you need your, your, your instruments. But okay. in terms of like what I see, I can know the difference between a cloud, a bird, and a, a, some weird object that's flying faster than me. Is that true? Yeah. So, um, so, so you're right. And actually some of the most, uh, you know, pernicious illusions that you get as a pilot are called spatial disorientation. And you can mimic that in your, in your, uh, $17,000 Herman Miller chair that I see you in right now. Uh, and that's by closing your eyes and just spinning around your vestibular organs, the fluids in them. Once you stop moving, the fluid has some inertia. And so we're getting some physics now we can nerd out. Um, that fluid keeps moving and you feel like you're in motion, even though you're stopped. So your body tells itself, uh, you know, that you're still in motion. So you actually, you try to counteract that and go the other way. Well, that makes things worse. And so you get into these graveyard spirals, it's called. But let me tell you something, James. What if I told you that some of the most dubious, most um, most skeptical of these pilots' accounts, of these eyewitness accounts, are other pilots? In other words, other expert witnesses on the deck of the aircraft carrier, when these pilots came back, they were putting like alien little green men, they were playing Independence Day movies, they were teasing them, they were very, very skeptical of the accounts of these pilots. In other words, the other people that had tens of millions of dollars of training were also seemingly quite skeptical of these people's accounts. What would you say to that? I don't know because it's like you said, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite... <laughs> expert on the other side. Uh, so it's hard to say, like you, you look at economics, I can make an argument that there's inflation. I can also make an argument that there's deflation and that there's massive deflation, even though all the headlines 
say that there's inflation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's a good practice to sometimes formulate both sides of an argument even better than the experts so that you're really prepared for a discussion such as this. So mm -hmm. I am willing to believe that there are pilots who are skeptical, but you know, and that's why I asked, is there video? Now I think I'm looking this up. This is the USS Nimitz mm -hmm. uh, 2004 encounter. It seems to be that there is video of it. There, there's video of, of some of the encounters, video of some of the radar data. There's not actual video of the Tic Tac necessarily itself. There, there is other video of FLIR, what's called forward-looking infrared data. Now, so I agree with you. And what I've done on my podcast, Into the Impossible, uh, on YouTube, in other words, I've taken a what's called a military red team approach. So a red team approach is when you and I are on opposite sides. Um, and I and you and I both believe that debate is basically pointless. Um, I'll know you've had on Peter Bogosian. I've invited him into the chat room. Um, you know, it's kind of how to have impossible conversations with his uh, co-writer, James Lindsay. Um, you know, they kind of make the case how you could convince people. But I, I basically think, you know, all debate is pointless. Uh, but anyway, uh, but if you can debate with love, in other words, you may not love the other person, but if you can debate with a common goal in mind of getting to some conclusion, maybe not agreement, but clarity, I think there's a purpose to that. And the military- right, like If you don't have a pre- if you don't have, And this is like anything in life. If you don't have a goal, you're much le more likely to be successful in the process. Yes, Yes. So in this case, my goal is just to understand, look, who would have more of a vested interest than a physicist to understand and want to know and comprehend the physics of the 21st, the 25th century from these alien craft, if they're indeed aliens? Or who would want to know more than an academician uh, than myself uh, working if our government is concealing stuff or if an adversarial government is concealing things? You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's been on a guest on my show, uh, unfortunately- called And my show. And called me a racist. I don't know. Did he call you a racist? Because he called me a racist. Right. He did uh, not call. Uh, you know, he might have actually. Maybe that's yeah. a good technique of his. Yeah, yeah. I Put think people it, it, off guard first. It's like you, it's like you're negging someone. Exactly, exactly. That's that's how I got my wife to to agree to go on a first date with me. Uh, but the um, uh, but the you know the the um, adversarial approach, when done with love, quote unquote, is to uh, is to take two opposing sides from equal and opposite experts and pit them together to come to a common goal of future understanding, which to me would mean understanding the future of the God equation or loop quantum gravity or some other physics that we don't understand. Now we have to put our our thinking caps on and really. Try try to understand it because the implications are astounding. If these are alien craft, the implications are astounding because we understand that we are not alone in the universe, in the soul, in the in the galaxy. Uh, perhaps there are other universes, parallel universes, advanced physics that we're going to get to. Perhaps they understand the secret of the Big Bang that you and I have been working on for the last better part of a decade together uh, that will take us to Stockholm, Sweden on December 10th, the anniversary of not Alfred Nobel's birth, but of his death and lead us to the promised land. Or it could unlock mysteries to protect our planet, to safeguard our species. They've gone through the great filter. They've avoided global catastrophic warming. They've avoided nuclear holocaust. And, you know, it could do so much good for our planet, right, James? So the stakes are incredibly high. The one thing I will say to add to this, and this is a math-based argument that they did not see aliens, mm -hmm. is that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Correct. Our civilization, as a civilization with space flying technology, is about 50 years old, give mm -hmm. or take a few years. Mm -hmm. 50 out of 13.8 billion. So, so what are the, and, and this is a harder question to answer, but you said, well, you know, is this 25th century uh, technology? That's implying that another civilization is just 400 years older than us. But what are the odds? They could be anywhere from zero to 13.8 billion years older than us. And if a, if a civilization has been around for a billion years, what are the odds that they have an, an object that we can humanly see and looks like a plane. Well, James, my, my grandmother, okay, this is very serious stuff. My grandmother was born uh, during the time of the horse and buggy, and she lived to make videos on TikTok, okay? This is very serious stuff, James. Um, no, she saw the space race. She saw the you know, horse and buggy, TikTok. Uh, it's incredible, right? I mean, that's in the span of one human lifetime. I mean, you go back two human lifetimes, you're connected to the Civil War. You go back three, it's right. the Revolutionary War, right? So but, it's not that many to get to, you know, physics of, but but the, when I say the physics, I'm really meaning like, if there is, we discovered unification of forces and fields you know, in your, yours and my lifetime almost, right? I mean, just, just in the last 50 years or so, we've discovered the unification of forces and fields. 
you're making my point though, which is that we've made so many discoveries in the past 100, 200 years. What if there's a civilization out there that had a billion years worth of discoveries? What are the odds that their technology would look anywhere near ours to the extent that we could say, hey, that's an object like my object and it's flying really fast. Like, that's my, I'm, yeah. So that that's my argument against these things being real. Right. Not, not just the physics argument, it's just the common sense argument. These right. objects have traversed space and time. They've survived the radiation, harsh radiation environment. They've re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. They've played around, first of all, they've played around in a very strange area of one nation's Federal Aviation Administration's warning area off the coast of a small state. And uh, But furthermore, James, they've done so in a way that avoids detection by any other means except for the U.S. Navy, but they have been detected by radar and infrared, uh, which we've been able to avoid from the stealth bomber and stealth fighters uh, for the last 45 to 50 years. It's very implausible that they could bend space and time, but they can't avoid radio waves. It's it's very strange to me. Right. So, so that's I'm not why saying I it's look- impossible. Yeah. And, and you know, here here's another point too, which is that when was when when did UFOs, the concept of aliens? Start Very good becoming question. popular. And it was mostly basically after World War II in places yes. like New Mexico. Well, guess what? The the source of all the fear in civilization in, in the past 70 years, or most of the fear, has been the atomic bomb, which was essentially developed in that area at, around, you know, that time. And so people, you know, the one thing about conspiracy theories is that if you believe in one conspiracy theory, you believe in others. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of conspiracy theories is that at some point, most likely a major institution has betrayed you or feared or made you afraid. So that puts you into this altered state where you, where you distrust everything. So, or, or you have, you know, different concepts about everything. So the creation of the atomic bomb scared people to such an extent and scared people about our institution of military and government and science and so on that suddenly People started seeing UFOs and believing them. Well, what's happened in the past year? Now that we've had all these different UFO news, we had a pandemic that and an economic lockdown that brought the planet to its knees, much in the way nuclear power did. So I'm questioning the psychology too of wondering about these theories as opposed to the science. It's another. There's another thing that's hanging over, I think, and I want to get your impression about it and uh, uh, your insight. There's another kind of thing in the zeitgeist now, and I feel like it's 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 not only the virus and so forth, uh, because this actually started to percolate uh, literally two or three years ago uh, before COVID, and that was uh, and that is like artificial intelligence machine learning, you know, Moore's law and, and other things, and kind of this, this notion of a, of a singularity sort of approaching, things like that. And I want to know, you know, what, where, where do you come down on that? Is that part of the analog of the nuclear kind of threat or the unraveling of the DNA mo- he- double helix in the 1950s, which concomitant with the UFO sightings, et cetera, brought about this kind of space age, et cetera? Um, nowadays, do we see that with the rise of China combined with the rise of AI? I was on a on an event last night where people were really speculating about how how bad AI could be and machine learning and how what the, how awful that is in other countries and how bad it's going to be in America. Do you think that's contributing to it? Because this is kind of like the extension, the simulation hypothesis. One version of it has an alien species creating us, basically. Right. And so, so let me clarify just one thing, and I I say this as a someone who went to grad school for computer science, who right. specialized in, in AI when I was in grad school. I worked on, among other things, I worked on what the computer that became Deep Blue, which was the right. AI program that eventually defeated the world chess champion, Gary Kasparov. AI is BS. And I'm saying <laughs> not the technology necessarily, but the words artificial intelligence is BS. Right. It's basically statistics that they use the word AI on to, to convince the Department of Defense to give them money. So scientists would raise money. Oh, we've got, we're going to create an artificially intelligent computer, uh, give us money. And we can, and we can make, you know, AI robots to be soldiers. And it was all BS. AI is nothing more than sophisticated statistics. That's why even earlier I referred to statistics as a mathematical replacement for intuition. So a human, for instance, on chess has intuition about what the best move is. And if the better the intuition is, the better the player is. A computer doesn't have intuition, but simulates the appearance of intuition by calculating what a trillion different moves look like. And by, you know, using, you know, an algorithm, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, called, you know, you know, basically an algorithm that searches the tree of move possibilities comes up with the best move. 
This isn't yeah. intelligence. It's just massive processing power. It's brute force. Yeah, combined with some basic algorithms, very basic algorithms. Even if it uses mm -hmm. neural networks, like I like the word neural in it, it's still a form of basic statistics. So when when we use speech recognition, this is this is nothing more than um, very sophisticated statistics uh, done by a guy named Kai Fu Lee, who's uh, when he was at Apple. Now he's mm -hmm. a very well, top investor in China. He was at Apple, then Microsoft, then Google, and you know all the top places for speech recognition. And then he became a big investor in China. But it was all. Uh, it's a kind of statistics called hidden Markov spaces. So uh, uh, it was now everybody else can call it AI. Right. He called it what it was. The other thing about AI is it's very particular. You either have a program that plays chess or you have a program that has good computer vision and can recognize objects, or you have a program that um, can write like Ernest Hemingway. But these are very particular domains and they're trained and programmed for those domains. There is not even, we're not even, we're no more advanced than we were in 1950 for an AI that's a more general Which purpose is artificial because, intelligence. Because we actually could be using it, again, going back to aviation. Um, so there's something that you do every time you fly into a, any airport of any size, you have to legally, by FAA regulations, the same ones that keep the you know UFOs within this very narrowly defined region of airspace off the coast of California, um, you have to check the weather. And there's a transmitter uh, that transmitted on a unique frequency for each airport. It says automated terminal information service, and it broadcasts the, the sky is clear, or there's a cloud over there, the runway is clear, because you have to know these. You can't see from the, you know, 10 miles away, there's a fire on the runway, you better not land here, go somewhere else, you have to divert, you might be low on fuel, right? So you're legally required to check for all these things. Well, you have to physically reach up, tune the radio, listen for a minute, and then uh, you have to write it down on a piece of paper. And this takes a lot of mental distraction. I mean, imagine it like you're driving a car and before you pull into your driveway, you have to know like, is your three-year-old in the drive? You know, like you have to write it down and, and call your wife or your husband or whatever. Like it's very distracting. It's very time consuming. It's time off task and pilots aren't like any better at multitasking necessarily. So why not have an Alexa-like device? It knows I'm 50 miles away from the airport. It knows what I'm gonna do. I'm landing because it knows where I took off. It has my flight plan. Plan, tune in the radio and have a little thing come up on a little computer, $50 Alexa, $20 Alexa can do this thing for me, right? Uh, pop up the weather and read it in my ear so I don't even have to look at anything. So it has 100% well, task, task saturation removed right there. Safety would go up tremendously. And then and it could tune in the radio. It could even tell the control tower that I have that information because there's another dirty secret, which is that only one pilot can talk at, at a time. So in other words, when I'm calling to San Diego airport, um, you know, this is uh, whatever my little Cessna is, I'm coming to land, no one else can talk. No other pilot can talk on the radio. It's a one-way, one-channel communication for the whole freaking airport. JFK, same thing. It's ridiculous. Well, and, I agree and, with you. That that would be a simple problem for AI, but again, it yeah. would be very domain-specific. Just right. like- Absolutely, just like 100%. A I'm not arguing about that at all, yeah. Like AI can, you know, look at radiology, you know, look at x-rays better than radiologists in, mm -hmm. in many cases, in 99% of cases. And that's another thing. So when you're in your doctor's office, so I'm going to get to my point in just a second, but you're in your doctor's office and you're describing, you know, I've got this like pain again, I'm, I'm thinking back to my late father, you know, he's got this pain and, and, and it's in his, in his abdomen and, and the doctor's like listening, but you know, maybe he's checking in his TikTok or whatever, um, you know, but he could be searching every JAMA article ever written instantaneously and saying in 97.3%, you know, confidence that patient has this form of cancer and you better have him, you know, have this colonoscopy or whatever and, and take, you know, but they don't do that. Why? It's the same reason it doesn't happen in aviation. There are lawyers involved. So the thing that's preventing the AI uprising is so much more pedestrian and boring than we think it is. It has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with like AI ethics being imposed. It's this mundanity. It's the it's this it's this boring layer where people are unwilling to turn over any control, even when it would right. save lives and protect people and enhance your. And I'm an educator, right? So I'm a professor at UC San Diego. Will my colleagues let an AI intelligent agent in the classroom? So I'm, I'm sitting there. Who who was this person who came up with the uh, idea? in Moscow in 1976 for super condensation inflation. Mm, you know, I don't know. Oh, oh, maybe. And then, boom, that could pop up on the screen with like a picture. Or Galileo, my friend Galileo, you know, pop up on the screen and here's his life. Here's his final resting place. Oh, Brian, you said he was tortured and imprisoned. No, he wasn't. He was actually in the spacious villa. Here it is. And it could actually correct 
my uh, my oh. misgivings and errors, but why don't we do that? Because the professors don't like that. They don't like supervision. And they use the pretext, which is BS, James. They say, oh, we don't want our kids to be, have their images you and, and yeah, I don't want a picture of my kids, you know, trafficked by alpha, whatever, you know, on the internet either. But uh, to augment the professionals, my class of so-called people, we are doing a huge disservice to the people we're supposed to be serving. And I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of sick of it. Well, I agree. I, and, and I agree that a lot of it's legal. I look at, take radiology again as an example. It's against the law. Yeah. You can't just look at an AI result of your x-ray. A radiologist is legally the only one who could tell you what the x-ray said. And that's why nurses won't tell you what it said. But yeah, to, to your point of like, is there a, a singularity? A, for the reasons we just said that they're so niche, uh, there, there's simply no, we're not even close to a general intelligence. B, one step further, why, what's so special about human intelligence? Like there's millions of species on the planet. None of them aspire or are even close to specifically human kind of intelligence. Why would a computer, right. why would we need a human uh, kind of intelligence in a computer? Why is that necessary? The whole basis for thinking that we even need a singularity just doesn't make any sense at all. And then the idea of having a human singularity is is kind of useless and doesn't make any sense we need you know as we develop the need for different tools like tools you just described even then ai will be developed and again just to repeat no one's ever built something that could both play chess and taste an apple and tell you if it tastes good so that just doesn't happen in computer science Right. Yeah. So, and again, my thing is, you know, my, my tagline for what it's worth is I don't care about artificial intelligence. I care about artificial wisdom. And I even care less about artificial wisdom than natural wisdom. Because what is it that makes a human being human? And this dovetails nicely into the book that you inspired me to write. And then I just got word from that not only you will write a forward to, but a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist will also write a forward to entitled- and, Jump. Uh, <laughs> sell out. Uh, not only was it inspired by you, but I stole the title from you and it's called Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner. Um, so I got word that uh, Barry Barish, winner, co-recipient of the 2017 Nobel Prize in physics for, he made a tiny discovery, discovered uh, binary black holes crashing together at half the speed of light uh, in a galaxy 1.3 billion light years away. Anyway, you and Barry are going to write the foreword to this book called Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner, inspired shamelessly by your book of the title think like a billionaire which i was inspired by the 1971 book uh think like a grandmaster by the chess player alexander kotov i didn't know that okay so you have yes. to put that in there because i was born in 1971 there and this go. book is coming out on my birthday uh in september uh, in 2021 when i turned 50 so that is going to be amazing james uh that is fantastic so that makes another birthday present for me You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game-like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. 
But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Just to remind people, we're talking on Twitter spaces with my good buddy, James Altucher, proprietor of the James Altucher Show, Stand Up New York, and uh, and many other business ventures. And James inspired me to write a book to take my nine interviews with Nobel laureates and take from them not their knowledge, which you can find in their Nobel lectures, but their wisdom. And their wisdom is replete. And I wanted to do it, James, you know, because there's something that we just touched upon briefly in our nine or so interviews that you and I have done, which could make a book on its own, uh, that at least, you know, maybe our spouses would buy perhaps, but, um, (laughs) but that, that would still, if if just our kids buy it, it's a bestseller. Right. Uh, but, uh, (laughs) neither my kids or my spouse will buy this book probably, but that's okay. (laughs) But, you know, I was kind of nervous to, to, um, to tell anybody about this book, you know, besides you, uh, because, you know, I was just like, you know, do you need permission to write a book? Like when it's based on interviews, even though I edited it, and it's transcribed and 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 so forth and it's in their words i didn't like add words and like brought, give my nobel prize to keating after all you know for one thing i was nervous because i wrote a book that was critical of the nobel prize called losing Which was the nobel very prize brave on its own by the way you kind of guarantee that you're never going to get one yeah although i do say it's a test you know if you want to see if brian keating is a hypocrite uh, if they offer me the Nobel Prize and I accept it, then you know I'm a hypocrite, James. So <laughs> that's a plus. So that that's definitely a plus. Um, so you know, but in this case, you know, and I interviewed all these Nobel Prize winners, and uh, and and then you know, but but I was like, you know, am I glorifying it? Am I lionizing that? You know, how how do we, how do you 
do it in a way that that doesn't give too much credit to the institution, but doesn't deny credit to the individuals. Because there's this kind of, you know, glamorization that I found uh, that occurs where, you know, I don't want to denigrate what they've done, but I want to distill what they've done into something that people can use. And you'll see, I, I sent you the text and, um, you know, it's only a hundred and something pages. I want to keep it short. I don't, I don't want to make it like a 400 page, you know, biography, you know, huge, you know, massive book that people have to wade through. I want it to be something that you could read on an airline trip, you know, when people actually start taking uh, flights across the country again. But one thing that, you know, really inspired me was, was this notion that I found from uh, that very happy soul, Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, who talked about something called the crutch of genius. Did you, did you ever see the movie, James? Um, not, not about Friedrich Nietzsche, but uh, called A Few Good Men with um, Jack Nicholson. Uh, I did not see it, no. Oh, it's the one with the Marines and they kill a guy. You never saw I that? No, oh, I never saw it. I should movie. see it. Oh, you I like Jack it. Nicholson. Oh yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's this, there's this really movie called A Few Good Men, and and um, you know it's kind of about like military code of honor, very well acted. But there's a part in the movie where at the end, basically Jack he's trying to justify the fact that they violated a code of you know law. They basically ordered this thing to happen, but it was for like the uh, own honor and the spirit of the Marines, whatever, it, whatever. It, people should watch it. I I don't know if you can spoil a movie that's thirty plus years old. So. You know, if you haven't seen it anyway, they end up killing this guy, but it's basically like a hazing thing. And, and this colonel played by, by Nicholson is, is trying to justify the fact that it's good to haze people because it brings out the code of honor of Marines. Anyway, they, um, they go through and, and at a certain point, he's yelling at Tom Cruise, who's playing this lawyer who's prosecuting them. And he's like, you don't know what courage is. And like, you want me on the wall. You know, you need people like me on the wall. You, you mock me, but you sleep better at night because there are people like me in the world. And, and I started thinking about that, like, do people really want to know what the Nobel Prize winners do? Or do they, like, the meta idea is like, or do they just want to know that people are out there who are smart and won the Nobel Prize? In other words, like, do you really care what the guy who won the Nobel Prize did? Or do you just want to know that there's smart people in the world? Like, Einstein lived here on planet Earth. I'm a human being. I live on planet Earth. Therefore, you know, there's something good about me. Like, what, what, do, you, what do you think about it? <laughs> yeah, well, it depends. Like, I, I think... The answer is yes and no. Like, ultimately, most people would be fine if they if they didn't even know that the Earth revolved around the sun. Like, hmm. no, you know, for thousands of years, society grew and flourished. It's not like all wars ended and peace reigned forever. Once we learned that this incredibly important thing that the Earth revolves around the sun, it it, it doesn't affect the average person. Let's say there's seven billion people on the planet, probably six point nine 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 billion. Their mm -hmm. lives would are not affected at all by the additional news that the world is not flat. <laughs> and I think it's nice to know that, oh, here's somebody who wrote poetry and turned them into songs who won the Nobel Prize in literature. Maybe I'll want to learn something about this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bob Dylan. Uh, mm -hmm. Or it's also nice to know that I can aspire or, or are there scientists, any scientist or anybody who writes a book can picture themselves aspire, you know, achieving the highest of goals, which in this case might be the Nobel Prize, or it might be being on a bestseller list, or it might be making some money, or it might be advancing the world in some way, or it's arguable that advancing the world has any relationship to meaning. But uh, I don't know. I think, the, I think the main people who think about the Nobel Prize are people who want the Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> so the quote by Nietzsche that I was going to uh, include in the uh, forward, if he'll, uh, I have to get his permission. That's going to be a challenge, but maybe you can help me with that. We can get um, a, uh, the AI GPT-3 version of yes. Nietzsche and see. So, <laughs> exactly. So Nietzsche says the following, we think well of ourselves, but nevertheless, we never suppose that we are capable of producing a painting like one of Raphael's or a dramatic play like one of Shakespeare's. We convince ourselves that the capacity to do so is quite extraordinarily marvelous, a wholly uncommon accident, or, if we are religiously inclined, a mercy from on high. Thus, our vanity, our self-love, promotes the cult of the genius. For only if we think of him as being very remote from us as a miracle, does he not aggravate us. But aside from these suggestions of our vanity, the activity of the genius seems in no way fundamentally different from the activity of the inventor of machines, the scholar of astronomy or history, the master of tactics. All of these activities are explicable if one pictures to oneself people who are always thinking as active in one direction, who employ everything as material, 
who always zealously observe their own inner life and that of others who perceive everywhere models and incentives who never tire of combining means together. The last thing I think appeals applies to you, James. Genius, too, does nothing but first learn how to lay bricks and then how to build and how continually to seek for material and continually form around it. Every activity of man is amazingly complicated. Not only that of the genius, but none is a miracle. So I think about you when I was reading that, actually. But like, there, there's a lot to unpack in that quote, which is, yeah. which is let's, take, let's take physics, for instance. Um, you know, why is, there, why is there such reverence for the Nobel Prize in physics? Well, two reasons, depending on who you are. If you're a physicist, you know enough about physics to appreciate the nuances of a very sophisticated and complex discovery. And like, like the, the guy who, you know, Barry Barish, who, mm -hmm. who, who you mentioned earlier, who- Your co-author, your, your fellow co-author. My, my co-author as the forward of, of your book, uh, he, you know, he found two black holes that crashed into each other at half the speed of light. Uh, you know, if you're a physicist, you can appreciate the nuances of why this is important, what discoveries can come from that, why that even that occurrence of that is something that's perhaps remarkable, or maybe you can appreciate how did he discover that? Like how, what were the measurements and tools he discovered in order to, to make that observation? So that's one appreciation. And so let's say there's 5 million physicists in the world. And that year he's recognized as number one mm -hmm. among 5 million. Of course, the other 5 million people who love physics so much that they aspire to be great, they're going to appreciate and, and not even not even be able to think that I too can be one, the number one among 5 million practitioners uh, in, in a field I love so much. Then there's the broader circle of what's a genius. Now we look at a picture of Einstein, we say that's a genius, but he has to do something that's genius-like as well. And, you know, many people, you know, out of the 7 billion people on the planet, maybe half of them want to be a genius, but only one is number one. And, you know, the, the Nobel Prize culturally has evolved into this thing where we, you know, the Nobel Committee says, we're the ones who pick number one. So, and we've given them that cultural responsibility. And so, so yes, it's unfathomable to think that, that I could be one of three, number one among three and a half billion people who aspire to be geniuses. But the other thing to unpack there in Nietzsche's quote is the word zealously. Like in order to be good mm -hmm. at something, it requires energy. You wake up in the morning and you have a certain amount of energy. And by the end of the day, you've run out of energy, so you need to sleep. But in order to, let's say you wanna be a writer. In order to write, you have to, you have to love it so much that sitting down and doing the act of writing doesn't require any energy from you. That can only happen if you truly love writing. If you don't love writing, but you feel like, oh, it's gonna be good for my career if I write a book, well, it's gonna take you a lot of energy to sit down at a keyboard and doing something so boring as to type keys for four or five hours or more per day in order to write a book. You have to love writing or, or the person who does love it zealously, who does pursue it zealously, will always defeat the person who, who is using that extra energy to convince themselves to do an activity. You don't have to convince yourself every morning, boy, I really need to do, you know, do experiments to see if there's uh, cosmic inflation at the beginning of the universe. Whereas some people might be like, oh, do I have to do this again? And they will waste huge amounts of energy, still will never defeat you at, no matter how much talent they have, let's say, they will never defeat the person who is zealous and, and, and also has taken the time to use that zealotry to learn the skills and nuances and have the aptitude to do what you do. So yeah. I, 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 there's, there's a couple ways to unpack his quote, and that's how I would unpack it. You need to love what you do. And of course, anything that's worth doing, there's going to be a lot of competition for it. And there's going to be a lot of maybe not jealousy, but professional envy. Like, I wish I was that smart, or I wish I was that good a writer, or I wish I was that good a musician. And, uh, you know, but that's because it's worth doing. No one says, man, I wish I was a good tic-tac-toe player, because that's not an activity worth doing. There's no value to that activity, and it's easy. So we're all the best tic-tac, in five minutes, we're all the best tic-tac-toe play players in the world, so it's not worth it. And so making something worth it is both hard and aspirational. Right. I've been thinking about that in terms of, you know, my niche, so to speak, with my podcast. And, you know, there's a lot of very brilliant and respected theoretical physicists, astronomers. You've had them on your show, Neil deGrasse Tyson. <clears throat> You've had on Michio Kaku, Carlo Ravelli, 
but you haven't had on many, you know, experimental physicists, experimental cosmologists. Brian Keating. You know, Brian Keating, you know. And I'm not saying this for fame. You know, somebody asked me, like, why are you doing this? And, you know, our mutual friend Noah Kagan. And I love Noah. And, you know, he's actually hosting his own live stream now, so he's not going to listen to this. Last year, he said, I want to get 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And I was like, why? And he's like, I just want 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm like, why? And he had no answer. And now he got to 100,000. He's like, I want 250,000. And there's just no reason. And he spends a lot of money doing it. And I love Noah. He's a great guy. You, he loves you. You love him. Uh, we're all a big happy family, right? But, um, but I think it's very yeah, shallow. Yeah, Noah's great. And I think it's empty. <laughs> and I tell this to his face. Um, and I love him. But, but the point is, there's no metric. There's nothing rational behind it. And I said the same thing. I said, I want 100,000 subscribers. And people are like, you're a hypocrite. You just said Noah Kagan, you know. Is a, and I said, I have a very uh, standardized metric. I want 100,000 subscribers. And if, you get, if I get to 100,000, I say, I want a million, you punch me in the face. Because the reason I want 100,000 is very concrete. I want 100,000 subscribers because based on my uh, metric so far, I've got 30,000 almost on YouTube, another 20,000 on iTunes, et cetera. And uh, based on my uh, metric so far, about 1% of my audience buys books of my guests. And my number one thing is for my physics colleagues and my other authors, uh, such as yourself, I want to promote your books. And, and you guys are my friends, and I, wanna, I want you guys to succeed and to be remunerated in some way. And the currency of remuneration is by buying your books, incurring your influence uh, through the sales of your books. So if 1% of your books are, you know, from come from my, or 1% of my audience buys your books, that's 100,000 people will buy 1,000 books. That won't make you a bestseller, right? But if you go on, it's not my only responsibility to make you a bestseller. In other words, you have to go on 10 Brian Keating-like shows, right? It's not my responsibility alone to make you a bestseller. So if you go on 10 shows as a physicist in nonfiction, uh, in this niche, in science, you will become a bestseller. 10,000 books sold on the first you know, week of sales, you will become a bestseller, and I will have done my part to advance your career. That's why I don't say a million, because I don't think you need to go on, you know, sell 100,000 books. You know, very few scientists sell 100,000 books. I haven't sold that many, you know, some total in three years in my book, and I don't care to. It's not That's not important to me personally. But for my guests to be able to do that, because I will get people who will say how many subscribe? Like I'm trying to get Ray Dalio to come on my podcast for Father's Day. I had Jim Simons come on my podcast last year for Father's Day. Unfortunately, these great men, both billionaires, they share a tragic uh, thing in common. They both lost uh, grown children, and mm. they're both very, um, very just incredible wise souls. Uh, they've taught me tremendously. Jim Simons personally, Ray Dalio remotely. And, you know, they asked me just, oh, not Ray, uh, not Jim. I mean, he's, he's like a father figure to me. But Ray Dalio's people are just, he's got a lot of demands on his time. They're like, how many subscribers do you have? And, uh, you know, Jordan Harbinger, people like you, you've got way more people that will follow you. So now Jay Yao is out there trying to get to, 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 to Ray Dalio with your download uh, numbers. But anyway, the point is, I, and he has a scientific research angle that, that appeals to me. He has an ocean expedition, and, and so hopefully I'm going to talk to him about research and science, and I'll be able to, to get some uh, connection there. But the point is, I have a metric, but it's based on something scientific. It's not based on ego or arrogance or whatever. I want to promote my guests in a specific way for a specific reason, and I want to co-align with their values, and that's it. I don't really care to do anything else. Let me unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I always say there's a good reason and a real reason. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the good reason. The good yeah. reason is real also. Yes. You just gave a really good reason to get 100,000 subscribers. And I could say I have the same reason, and also I like to provide value. I like to help people, and I feel mm -hmm. a podcast is a good format to do that. Mm -hmm. But another reason, perhaps maybe more real for me, is that I wasn't loved enough as a child, mm -hmm. and so I seek the love and approval of nameless strangers and others who – subscribe to my YouTube channel or my podcast. So funny, James. My wife was asking me yesterday about you because we invited you to come to my my birthday party in San Diego. Which, which I think held. I'm going to go to. I hope you you will. I would love that so much. So we invited you and Robin to save the day. It's right next to where you and I gave our TED Talk seven years ago. I cannot believe yeah. it. But anyway, uh, but she was like, because, you know, do you and James ever have a conversation that's not recorded? And now I'm like, not only do we record it, sometimes we do dual recordings. Like today we're on Twitter Spaces and we're recording for his podcast. We'll probably put on my podcast. Sometimes we do club. But I'm like, I don't really care. Like, I love James because what he does and like we have James Quandrell is on uh, listening on Twitter. Like James is... um. Like, I don't know if it's important. Like, she's like, well, what is he like offline? And I'm like, I don't really care. Like, what James does is part of who he is. And I just think that's so magical. Like, I don't, I, I have friends offline from Twitter and, and, and from podcasting. 
I don't really care. You're a unique person. What you do for people, James, is incredible. And how you got there, what you've done for me. I mean, I wouldn't have written this book. I wouldn't have started this business idea that you and I have been talking about. I wouldn't, and, and like, sometimes I'm kind of mad at you because like you send me on these missions and I'm like, I'm trying to impress James. Like, am I doing this because I want to do it? Or am I doing it? I wrote a book. I've got Nobel Prize winners doing stuff, you know, at, off in the distance, but it's it's all good. And And I know that in the end, it's, it's going to be important, not just for me, but for my audience, which I'm trying to please, but not only for my audience, for, for me. And, and actually, as you're saying, to like, we all have these real reasons. And some of them are, are you know, to repair and to do the tikkun olam, the healing of ourselves and healing of the world. And you do that, you know, that's part of who you are. And, and you know, you know it, it's interesting too, because it gets, and I always think physicists are the new philosophers because you wonder at the same thing that's, philosophers in centuries past have wondered about how did the universe begin? Was there a reason the universe began or was it a random event? Is there, is there meaning behind the fact that the universe exists? And of course, you know, in some religions and in some philosophies, there is reason and, uh, 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 an argument that, you know, there was, let's say, you know, this religion is true versus this other religion, but there's also plenty of philosophies that say, look, everything's pretty, not only is everything pretty meaningless, but it's pretty, it's actually absurd to assume that there actually is meaning, but that's still, a, that doesn't mean you live a, a horrible life. It means you have to search out and find your own meaning instead of outsourcing it to a text or a, a, a community that shares the same faith or, you know, a society that believes a certain set of rules are better than another set of rules. You kind of have to find, and this is kind of the premise of my book, Choose Yourself, is you kind of have to find your own personal reason to live and do things and love things and share with others. And, you know, doing that, my argument would be, you're going to find and do things you love as opposed to live a life filled with hate because that's even more meaningless than, than most other things. Because yeah. if life is meaningless, it's certainly meaningless to then hate something. Yeah, I, and, I, heard, I heard something that, you know, um, Sam Harris said to Lex Friedman, and and it was like, you know, you can never be happy. You can only become happy. And I was like, well, is that really true? And I, I think, well, first of all, none of us who have children, you know, a biological or ideological, we both have a mutual friend, Melanie Notkin, who doesn't have biological children, but she's got millions of ideological children. We both love her, you know, and it's like, no one who has a stake in the future cannot can sleep like perfectly easy about the future. We'll always have that that concern about it, and and um, I I just think it's 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 hard to be. Per but there'll be these moments, and Kurt Vonnegut said it. You know, like if this isn't happiness, like every now and then, just stop and say like, when you feel happy, you know, like recognize it. I'm feeling happy. There's something good about life when I feel happy. And who cares how you got? I mean, hopefully you're not doing something you know destructive and evil. But if you feel happy to recognize that, the more times you do that, that positive self reinforcement is gonna just make you feel like even now, you know, like today is as I said, the yard site, the anniversary of my father's passing, and there's something good about it. You know, in a sense that I'm thinking about him, I'm remembering the good times that I had with him. I'm thinking about my children and how they, you know, sometimes they'll they never met him and they'll connect me to him. They have like a sense of humor or you know, they'll do something that just reminds me of like, how do they know that? Like, how does that happen? It's, it's miraculous. You know, one time I wrote an article uh, and I forget the exact title, it was something like 10 things I enjoy. And one of, uh, one of the items I wrote was uh, uh, melancholy. I like feeling mm. melancholy. <laughs> and people were like, well, isn't that sadness? Like, why would you like feeling that? And yet there's something very special and poetic about melancholy. Like this is the anniversary of your father's death, which makes you think about, you know, your own children and and perhaps how they will think about you after you die and and maybe it reminds you of of your father and maybe he would like you would have liked to have seen them now like mm -hmm. making a joke when they're so little and whatever and that's a melancholy feeling but it's a really nice feeling and people sometimes think happiness is just one dimensional like hey i want to party now <laughs> but but really it's more it's all this mixture of feelings like like we talked about why aspire to do something difficult? You know, when you read the Nietzsche quote, and it's very painful to do something difficult. Think about your own experience. You created such an amazing experiment. Um, I mean, a, a telescope in Antarctica, 
that's goal was to see so far into space that you see the beginning of the universe. Like if that's not arrogance, I don't know what is. Know. And <laughs> it's difficult. And then it's painful when you can't achieve the exact results you want, but you still love doing it. Even though there's pain, there's just as it's 50% pain, 50% semi good but you mm -hmm. still do it even knowing that like you would be much happier just sitting on a couch watching tv and instead you chose to go to antarctica and build a giant telescope that mm -hmm. maybe it works maybe it didn't and you didn't win the nobel prize right, right? but you love doing it and, uh, and that's the thing we've talked about it in the past i think but you know if you think about this concept of entropy, which most people talk about as disorder or chaos, but really you can think about it as like the number of possibilities. And when you're born, you know, there's like infinite possibilities in a certain sense, but there's no energy. Like you're not organized. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Like the baby's got like all these possibilities, but you know, he or she can't do anything. And when you're about to die, like a minute before you die, you've got all this wealth, you've got all this attention, fame, power, but you have no energy and you're, you're about to die. And so you've got maximum entropy again, but you've got no free energy to do anything. So it's somewhere in like where we are and the Talmud like breaks down the different ages of our lives. And, and like when we're in our 50s, it's actually like peak power. It's like maximum utility of, of love, of dollars, of, you know, whatever you know, they call so it back then. That's, that's really fascinating, actually. Like I like this model where at some point in your life where you you still have physical health, but you have resources and you have a support system and you have the, the self-awareness to create the right support system for yourself, that's when you have maximum kinetic energy, yes. let's say. Yes. And the key is to keep the potential energy that you had as a child into your adult years so you can so you can use that you can transform that kinetic energy into potential energy because you can have all these resources and then say you know what i've earned it i'm going to watch tv for the rest of my life exactly and, and then you're not using your potential energy mm -hmm. but if you keep high your your and what is potential energy well it's curiosity it's questioning the world it's being a skeptic and it's and it's falling in love with different activities and exactly. domains and so on so so if you can sort of figure out ways to maximize your potential energy and there's various methods perhaps of doing that uh but you know you could read a lot and get excited about things you could write down i write down 10 ideas a day mm -hmm. you could meditate on different topics you could you know there's lots of ways to find out what your interests are and combine them and so on and keep your potential energy up These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Do you remember what you said in your TED talk here in San Diego in 2014? You said um, a child, you know, laughs like 300 times a day and an adult laughs five times a day. And that I started to translate that into laws of physics. You know, if you think about it in, in terms of entropy, like you have a certain mm. store of happiness. Now convert happiness into, into like energetic terms, like it takes energy to laugh. Okay, but beyond that, like you're storing up, there's like tension. And you know this from your standup, uh, you know, in New York and your comedian, like it's stored up tension and then it's releasing tension. That's a form of energy storage. That's a form of conversion and from transformation in one form to another. But then I started to think, leveraging off your idea, well, like I bet it's the other way around too. Like when you're a when you're a baby or you're a kid, you cry three hundred times a day, um, and when you're an adult, you don't cry as much, right? I uh, cry four hundred times a day, but that's now okay. I was going to say. <laughs> but when you're an adult, when you're a when you're a kid, you cry because things make you sad. But when you're an adult, you're you cry more when things make you happy, right? I, I cry when my kids are born, or um, yeah, I cry when my 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 father passed away, obviously. But but when you think about like things that bring you great joy. Um, they they tend to make you really emotional. Uh, at least that that's the way I feel now. And so it's another optimization or energy curve, like where these things intersect. Like the laughter curve declines, but then the the happiness curve, you know, can can rise. And they're expressing themselves in different ways. And then I started to think in another way, like again, how many ways, James, 
could I double your happiness right now? I mean, how many ways, like legally, even illegally, like, you know, whatever, you're going to keep, I don't want you to get divorced, you know, whatever. Like, you're not, like Robin, she's beautiful, you love her. You're not going to get like two Robins. Like, how could I double your happiness right now? You couldn't have more kids. I, I don't know if that would make your life a lot happier, by the way, if you had like 10 kids right now. But um, how can I make your life twice as happy right now? Is there like just, or 10 times happy, or let's say twice as happy right now. How could you do it? If you broaden out as much as possible, what makes people feel well-being? Let me say well-being instead of happiness. Well, mm -hmm. a sense of community, uh, a sense of mastery, and a sense of freedom. So community we're participating in. We mm -hmm. become greater and greater friends, and we're part of a, a community of podcasters and mm -hmm. arguably thinkers, and and you know we know a lot of the same people. So we're all we're building community, and that feels good, and it makes me happy. And so by having these conversations, actually builds our community, and it also builds the community with the people listening to this. A lot of people communicate with you, communicate with me, and they have their own goals and agendas. But I I enjoy that community too. Mastery is you know learning something that's that you love that's worthwhile so uh, you know again mastery is not being the greatest at tic-tac-toe but mastery might be i'm going to unify the theory of relativity with quantum mechanics and 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 moving towards that goal is is mastery and that feels good it's a huge dopamine hit and then freedom could mean money or it could mm -hmm. mean lack of a need for money or it could mean lack of a need for certain types of relationships or a lack of a need. You know, I think freedom has to do more with a sort of minimalist approach to things so mm -hmm. that the things you need to be happy are fewer and fewer. So, right. so I feel all those things I'm accomplishing by talking with you and, and, and having this conversation, you know, and, and, you know, I want to throw another analogy by, uh, by you that is similar to the potential energy and kinetic energy. And of course I'm going to use chess as an example. So in chess, if you're playing chess, I forget, you know, you know, the rules to chess, right? Yeah. 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 But, not, so in chess, there's, there's two types of advantages. I'm ranked negative. I have a negative ranking. <laughs> there's, there's two types of advantages one could have in chess and arguably in life. So there's, there's what's called static advantages and what's called dynamic advantages. So a static advantage is if I win someone's queen, I'm a queen ahead for the rest of the game. And you can't take away the fact that I'm a queen ahead. That's a static advantage. It's, it's somewhat permanent. And a dynamic advantage is, oh, my king right this moment is safer than the other person's king. So now that's a, a dynamic advantage that's real and it's on the board, but I need to transform that dynamic advantage into a static advantage quickly. I, in that particular case, I need to attack the king because it's weaker than mine. And so he has to, and so to force him to eventually give me something. So mm -hmm. I then convert that dynamic advantage into a static one. So a, a, an equivalence in life is I, let's say I really, you know, love being an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I might have a dynamic advantage in that I, I have a lot of ideas. I have an idea that no one's thought of. I maybe have some resources where I could raise some money. These are all dynamic advantages, but if I don't use them, they'll disappear, but I can make a company that, you know, using my dynamic resources and convert it into a static advantage by helping many people monetizing my dynamic advantage by maybe selling a lot of products or selling the company. And now I've converted it into a static advantage. Uh, Same thing with writing a book. Many people have great ideas for a great book. They would be the best book in the planet. That's a dynamic advantage because not everyone has an idea for the greatest book ever, but now you have to convert it into a static advantage by sitting down and writing uh, the book. And so in order to do all of this, you have to have some self-awareness, like what am I good at? What, mm -hmm. what resources do I truly have to convert a dynamic advantage to a statement? Do I have free time? Do I have love for what I'm doing? Do I have the support of others? And do I have a network to, to bring things to fruition? And so you, you work hard building these dynamic advantages a little bit at a time, incrementally, mm -hmm. they could be all incremental, small dynamic advantages, but always to move forward, you have to convert dynamic advantages as much as possible into static ones and have a methodology for doing that. Mm. And that's, that's similar to the kinetic energy to potential energy. It's actually maybe even a little more specific about mm. how to do it. I guess I was even thinking at, a, at an even more fundamental level. Like if I, if you think about like doubling your happiness, that's why I made the joke, like you can't clone Robin or you can't water ski behind two yachts or something like that. But 
I, I bet you could think of a lot of ways or, or, you know, you can't, you know, you, you've got like double the number of, uh, of, of Bitcoin or, or you've four times many books or whatever that you're, yeah. Okay. It's, it's incrementally happier, but you know, that as, as well as anybody, I don't have to tell you, you know, adding a dollar, once you have a certain amount of money, doesn't really increase your happiness beyond a certain point because, you know, there's, there are more precious resources than, than actually money. But actually the, the point I'm trying to make is it's, it's just much easier uh, happiness is is what in physics is known as a, as an unstable equilibrium. So in other words, you can you can't you you might be able to be happy in contrast to what Sam Harris would say, or, or even you could become happy without being able to be happy. But once you get happy, there's so many more entropic states of unhappiness. They far outnumber the happy states. You know, for example, right. every single relationship you have could go bad or just one relationship between a relationship, let's say to one of your kids and with another one of your kids, that relationship could go bad. They could have a fight and that will percolate to you. And there's, there's like N factorial relate ways, you know, let's just say N squared. You have five kids. That's 25 different combinations. Anyway, there's, we went through the math once before, but the point is there's many more States where James is unhappy than States where James is twice as happy. There's Hence many more States. Hence the importance when you have a dynamic advantage that you know will not last forever, like, oh, I have a good relationship with my kid, even more important to convert it to a static advantage. So if mm. you value having a good relationship with your kid, uh, which I do and you do, then, mm. oh, maybe now's the time to take a vacation with my kid or at least make an extra phone call to my kid or help them out in some way or have them help me in some way because that might be a pleasure to them. So always important to recognize that happiness is ephemeral, i.e. a dynamic advantage. And depending on how you're getting that ephemeral happiness, uh, how do you turn it into something that's static, that's long lasting mm -hmm. and improves your life in, in a meaningful, long lasting way? And kids, again, I don't wanna, you know, and I'm always thinking about like, who's my avatar? Like, who am I thinking about? And you talked about this, I think, with James Quandrell and other people on the podcast. Like, who are you thinking about? Or, or that podcaster, Dumas, or one of these guys that you talk, like, who's your avatar? Like, who are you plan pitching towards? Who's the book for? And yeah, you always have to think about that because the worst thing is like, I wrote the book for everyone, you know, or, or my yeah. podcast is for everyone who likes the Nobel Prize and knitting. Like, no, it's going to suck. And everyone's going to hate the hell out of it. But, um, but you know, I thought about like, you know, so sometimes when I think about it, I think about like Melanie, our mutual friend who we love, you know, she doesn't have biological kids, but that doesn't matter. You know, kids are, are, are interesting to me. I've been thinking about this, like physicists love the concept of, of teleportation. We love the concept of time travel. We love, you know, we think about these exotic things like wormholes and black holes and other kinds of holes, maybe. I don't know. I don't want to get into that. This is a clean show. We're doing a clean Twitter spaces here, James, a tight the family project, a tight two hours here. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, um, you know, we're obsessed with these things, but I'm like, what if you have that already? What if it's called kids? Let's just say biological, ideological. You can be, you know, a big brother, big sister at any, uh, you know, you can adopt. I don't care. You know, we happen to have biological kids and ideological kids. I teach students, you teach people around the world, you mentor people. Um, you just can't go there physically. In other words, I can take my values and I can teleport them into the future and uh, and I won't be there for it. But but I think we get jealous because we say we want to be there. I want to have my cake and eat it too. And I never really understood, like, what does that mean? Like, the cake is there, but you ate it, but it's still there. Like, it doesn't taste good, like, unless you die. But no, like, you want to be, I think what it means in the context of teleportation for a physicist is we want to, like, instantaneously snap our fingers and appear on Mars. And I'm like, well, what's there on Mars? Is there, like, my office? Is there my podcast? You know, oxygen in my lungs with me? Like, what comes with me? You know, my memories, do they stay here? Do they go with me? Like, it's, it's, so, it's so ludicrous to even think about, just like maybe these UFOs, these aliens uh, that we started off talking about. But, but it's totally dynamic. You can have teleportation. You can teleport your values. You can teleport your wisdom. You can tell, and, and some of it's in the form of a book, some of it's in the form of a child or, or wisdom, and, and some of it are these little messages that you implant in your children. Because, you know, one of my pieces of advice I give to new parents, um, you know, is the best time to discipline your 15-year-old daughter is, you know, when she's five. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm not That's an expert. Quote you know, by now, but, but, you know, it's, it's like another thing I've gotten from physics is like, you know, in physics, something that reflects all the light that you send on, it's called a mirror, right? So bounces off, comes back to you. Then there's this concept like the cosmic microwave background that I study is called a black body. A black body absorbs and emits all different forms of light. It reflects nothing. It's completely absorbing and it's completely emitting. You look at it, it's completely black. 
Um, and then there's something that does both, absorbs everything and reflects everything. And that's called a kid. <laughs> in other words, like you do anything in front of your kid, a kid is like a hypocrisy detector. A kid is an absorber. A kid is a reflector. And it's just like, I think kids, you kids know- Kids are for, good bullshit detectors. Totally bullshit. You know, it's, but it's, you know, and the question is, how do you avoid trying to make them into your clone? Because I don't want my kids to be my clone. And and I you know and 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 how do you make them? Because you 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 don't want to say like oh I learned so much from my kids like you know I love President Obama you know but sometimes you say like oh I learned this thing you know with some world leader I learned that from my 15 year old daughter I'm like I don't want you learning stuff from your 15 year old like like the nuclear launch codes what are we talking to? like what exactly did you learn you know and recently he's talking about these UFOs and stuff like what did he learn you know but anyway um, you know the point is like what what do you want to learn and um, you know from your kids. I think you can learn certain things. You know, they have certain traits, but I always say scientists are like kids. You know, they're curious, they're imaginative, they're creative. They don't play well with others. They're jealous. They want credit. They want funds. They want, you know, it's like, yeah, you, you have to take the good with the bad. Uh, and for me lately, looking at all the, you know, the developments in physics, you know, we're really competing, you know, for this uh, tension, for constrained resources. And lately I've been really kind of, you know, not not panicking, but but certainly worried about things like you know string theory and these theories of everything and and what does it mean? Is it reflective of something psychological in physics that's occurring that 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 physicists maybe are coming to a crisis that we aren't that meaningful? Like you said, we're like modern philosophers. By the way, that's insulting to most physicists. <laughs> I mean, if you tell Lawrence Krauss, who's going to be coming up on my show in the next couple of weeks, if you say like, oh, you're like a modern day philosopher, he'll like kick you in the, you know, in the nether regions. Um, most philosophers are not perceived as contributing something useful to physics. I happen to like philosophy, but um, what do you make of this, this, you know, kind of obsession with, with theories maybe that aren't testable or, or, or these biggest picture things? Is it, is it a symptom or is it just, you know, part of the grand tradition of scientists since time immemorial? Well, er earlier we said that, you know, 99.999% of people their lives would not change if they thought the earth was flat or if they thought the earth was round. It just is yes. not, does not make any sense. They, they don't care. I don't care if mm -hmm. the earth is flat or the earth is round. Mm -hmm. And I think people have to get used to the fact that it really is all absurd. It's absurd that you went to Antarctica with a giant telescope to detect gravitational waves through the cosmic background radiation and it's ended up detecting dust and <laughs> ended up detecting dust instead a dust buster this is the potential energy of a kid a kid doesn't need a reason to play in the sandbox it's just fun for them that moment we i think we judge ourselves a lot like on are we doing something that's worthwhile to society uh, is a painter more worthwhile than a bank teller or is a bank teller who gives people money more worthwhile than a painter i think people get into these questions but it doesn't matter if i want to if I want to play poker all day, which is what some people do, uh, mm -hmm. that's important to me. And I might learn how to play better poker, but I also might learn other things about myself. Like I might learn, you know, how competitive I am and how to be competitive in other situations. I might have friends because now this is the way I get to sit around a table with 10 other individuals making fun of each other. Or, or maybe, you know, I make money that I could feed myself with and whatever. But a lot of times people say, oh, I feel so bad because I'm doing this all day when other people are, you know, you know, doing brain surgery and saving lives. You know, it just is what it is. Like, I think we can't, I think we have to give ourselves permission a little bit more to go outside of the rules of society. And sometimes those rules say you have to go to college and then go to graduate school and then get a job and you have to make money so people will like you and you could support a family. Other the rules might be, you know, oh, you have to believe in Democrats or Republicans or whatever. But other things might be like, hey, it's it's you it's okay to play a game all day, and there's no there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's it's mm -hmm. just absurd. Like I wonder this because there are some days I play games all day, and yeah. I play in particular in the past few months. I've been obsessively playing chess and trying to get better because it feels good mm. to get better at something I love doing, and. uh uh, sometimes I wonder, well, I've spent the past 20 years or 30 years helping people or starting businesses or writing. What am I doing now? This is like useless. And so what? 
Like mm-hmm. I'm playing, I'm a kid playing in a sandbox and every now and then it's like we were saying earlier, it's good to kind of re-energize that potential energy inside of you. Otherwise you deplete it very quickly. If you, if you hate something again, it requires more energy. So you're going to deplete your potential energy yeah. and, and then you really will be doing something useless. Yeah. That's, I, I've been waiting to ask you about that for a long time uh, before I do. And I don't want to forget. So first of all, we're talking on Twitter spaces. Usually I'm on clubhouse. Uh, the only place on all the internet and any place in the universe, the known multiverse, where I have more of a social following than James Altucher. Uh, shout out to people in the room. Uh, Danny Miranda was there. I love you, Danny. Listen to you for months and months. Uh, James Quandrell is there. Jay Yao, super producer to the star. Jay-Z is there. Jay-Z. I don't think it's the Jay-Z, but there's a Jay-Z there. Anyway, we um, uh, we are— well, That's the uh, real Jay-Z. He's a oh, buddy. Okay, yeah. cool. Um Anyway, um, I want to ask you, James, I've been thinking about this for a lot. Here's a provocative statement that I have uh, been making. I make it to physicists, but I'm going to make it to you in the context of chess. I know that AI, because of you, uh, AI can beat human beings at chess. I don't think AI can create chess. In other words, I don't care if AI can beat us at chess. And obviously where I care about this is can AI create physics that humans cannot create. But I want to ask you, can an AI ever create chess? And if so, if not, who gives a crap? Like, why worry about what AI can do? In other words, AI, can, can it create something that human beings will find fascinating for thousands of years? Or is it merely just better at it the way that a steam engine is better than a horse or a human being at lifting heavy objects? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it almost suggests that maybe there's some kind of measurement tool for how intelligent an AI is. So for instance, a car is faster than a marathon runner or is faster than the fa- than the fastest man on the planet. Uh, a car is always going to be faster. Does that mean it's no longer useful to have races in the Olympics because a mechanical car is faster? No, humans still compete with each other. And then there's a next level, which is like with chess, it's been shown not only can you create a, a, ch- a, a program that plays very good chess, you can cater, create a program that by observing other chess games can learn the rules of chess and then become the best in the world at chess. So Google in four hours, let loose alpha zero on a database of chess games. Alpha zero learned the rules just by looking at these games and then became the best player in on the planet. But then the third level is can an AI come up with the rules of a game as rich and interesting as chess or poker or bridge or backgammon or, or, or tennis or whatever, can an AI create those rules? And my guess is, yeah, it's just, I have never known anyone to try that, but my guess is, yeah, an AI can come up with the rules of a game that's interesting by studying all the other fun mm-hmm. games. So let, let's say you gave the an AI the rules of thousands of games and you labeled some of those games fun and some of those games boring. Then I bet you an AI can come up with the rules of let's say a card game that is more fun than boring. Mm. Um, although that would be fascinating to try. That's a good that's a good experiment to do. I don't know how to do it, but but certainly AI people out there know how to do it. But then maybe another level of intelligence is if if a program is like that, can it, can that same program become a good chef and make good recipes? Maybe uh, can can that same program uh, learn how to recognize objects? on the road and then help drive a car. Can that same program design a car Mm -hmm. that's better than the car it's currently humans have designed? You know, I think these are all good questions. And my bet is an AI can do these things, but has to be specifically programmed to do it. I wonder, yeah, the next extension of that would be, you know, can, can an artificial intelligence create new laws of physics? In other words, you put in Newton's laws and does it come up with the theory of relativity? I don't think so. I don't think that there's such, there was such a creative leap uh, to think about space time as being a fabric or think about space time as behaving geometrically, not just thinking about uh, in terms of calculus of variations, thinking about differential geometry. First of all, I mean, by the way, coming up with that from just the laws of now, perhaps you'd get a parabola from observations. You'd have to put in some observations. But uh, there is sort of this this extra special notion. It's almost like you know, would a, would a computer come up with art? Yes, but again, it's that kind of bad statistician that you spoke of earlier. That is what we call machine learning. But uh, computers have come up with good uh, musical compositions after being fed Mozart's works and have 
actually you people couldn't tell if this was a Mozart work or not. Like computers can do this if they're programmed specifically enough and trained on enough examples. And and it's a good question. But would they like, come up with Mozart if they only had, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star? In other words, it, will they come up with something beyond Mozart, not just like analogous to Mozart? If I think that they'd come up with white noise. I think that they could come up with, you know, like in other words, would they create cubism from just the, you know, from from uh, the Renaissance masters? Yes, the, but my argument is yes. Any, any, all of these theoretical things. Um, it, it's like, by the way, it's like quantum mechanics. If we say can a computer become intelligent, we don't know. But if you suddenly pinpoint the locate the, the exact thing you want, then the answer turns into yes. Even though previously it might not have been possible, we don't know. Once you specifically give a specific use case, by uh, the answer is probably yes. A com a computer can do that. And uh, you know, a lot of people you know know me and you from the most recent books we've written, you know, you wrote Losing the Nobel Prize. I, I wrote a book called Choose Yourself and a bunch of other books. But the very first thing I wrote, I'll put it in the chat here, is, and I, I forget the title now, it was in, it, it actually was in 1989, and it's called A Mechanically Assisted Constructive Proof in Category Theory. And it was presented at some, uh, the 10th International Conference on Automated Deduction. And what it did was, is that we wrote code that proved a fairly obscure mathematical concept from a basic set of assumptions. And using that basic set of assumptions and putting in a final goal that we wanted it to achieve, it, it was an AI that does mathematical theorem proving. So once you give it a goal and you work towards it, it can, it can construct, like if it knows twinkle, twinkle, little star, and it knows the difference between twinkle, twinkle, little star and some musical compositions by Bach or, or some predecessor to, to Mozart. And it understands like, oh, okay, here's how Bach is a little bit more sophisticated than twinkle, twinkle, little star. And then it applies those tricks to coming up with the next generation of, you know, musical compositions. It could come up with something like a Mozart. Mm. Interesting. So yeah, I'm going to tweet that out so that people have access to this. Cause this is really important. I wonder if it's a, uh... If it's firewalled and paywalled off, I, I can probably no. post it. That's no, not I, okay. Great. So I just ordered is, the uh, book yesterday because I realized I didn't have. I oh, didn't have a, a copy. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. So this is a whole book. It's not just. Uh, it's not just an article. Oh, it's uh, been well, cited the article twice. Was, was part it's been of cited a... twice. Awesome. You know your H index then is uh, is calculable. You know what H index is, James? Uh, it's how many people uh, cite a paper I wrote, a scientific paper I wrote. It's it's the number of citations that have it a number of papers that have at least at least eight citations H citations, it's analogous page rank that that Larry, Larry Page invented for uh, a World Wide Web searches. So in other words, if you have one paper and has a ten billion citations, that could be like a one hit wonder. But if you have a hundred papers and they each have a thousand citations, that act to an academic that's better than one paper with a hundred thousand citations because it proves that it wasn't just like a one one hit thing. So your H index in the case where you have one paper with 100,000 citations would be one. <laughs> you only have one paper and it has 100,000 citations. The other case you'd have, you have 100 papers with 100,000 citations, your H would be 100. So it becomes exponentially harder to add a single digit. So my H index after you know 17 years as a, as a professor is only 45. The most renowned professor, Nobel Prize winners that are on my list, they have an H index of maybe 100, 110. So that means they have 110 papers that, or they probably have 500 papers, but only a hundred of them have been cited more than a hundred times. Isn't that That's, interesting? That, so that your age index is probably two and you can find this on Google scholar. I'll, I'll put my Google scholar on and Twitter. So what's my er Erdos number? Your Erdos number. I'd have to, that would take me some time. So it would take me, I bet your Erdos number is larger than your uh, bacon number. Your, your number of degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. Actually, I interviewed, and you should meet this man, um, uh, not only uh, his advisor, S Stephen Strogatz, was a professor at Cornell, where you were a pr uh, student, but his student, Duncan Watts, was a um, wrote a book called Six Degrees, and it's about what's called the small world theory of networks, that you and I can both get to, you know, either one of us could get to uh, Pope John Paul's, you know, ne great nephew. Some, I don't know. Hopefully, he doesn't have a great nephew. Although, by the way, the word nepotism, you know where that comes from, right? No, it comes from nephew of the Pope, quote unquote, nephew of the Pope. 
That's so, so when funny. popes would give jobs to their nephews, it was really their children that they had had illegitimately. So that's where that uh, august term comes from. Uh, so but funny. anyway, I wonder. Um, yeah. So. Um, so I, th- I think it's interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not a sanguine that we could really come up with uh, come up with new laws of physics that that would be really outside of the domain of what a human being could come up with with computers. And it's not for lack of trying. Um, again, I think it's this. Well, AI what, what's problem. a what's a first principle in physics? Let's just play with this for a second. W- what are like two or three first principles of physics? Well, so there's the the applicability of mathematics to physics, which is unique in physics in some sense, like. Uh, I mean, computer, you know, comp science or whatever has has math embedded within it. Theoretical computer science is almost pure math, as you know. Uh, but but you know, biology, you don't have to like you know group theory to understand biology necessarily. But to understand quantum mechanics at, at elementary particles, so forth, you do need to understand group theory, topology, um, differential uh, calculus, et, et cetera. So that math is the underpinning uh, basis of the model of reality that we associate with physics is a tenant of of physics but the problem is there's no you know we don't know why that's true and wigner called that the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physics. well what's an example where where mathematics translates into physics so um uh so i'm holding up a coffee cup here james can see it you guys on twitter or on the podcast can't see it but it has a mug it's a mug it has a handle on it so this object has a um has different properties it has a handle which has a hole in it so if this were made of clay and not baked clay, I could deform it and I could make it into a donut, a shape of a donut. So it has a topological structure. And that donut, uh, but I couldn't make it into a flat disc or a ball without fusing together the whole. And that would change what's called the genus number, the topological character of this mug. And so all things that have one hole in it behave the same topologically. In other words, you can embed, you could put a loop on the surface of this, imagine and putting a tiny little loop of dental floss on the surface of this mug, and you can contract that loop anywhere on the surface of the of the mug except where the handle is, because the hole prevents you from contracting around the handle itself. You can't contract it, right? The handle prevents you from contracting certain loops to a point. So that that means there are certain loops that cannot be contracted to a point. Right. So that's but the, but the laws of topo- the rules of topology are derived ultimately from the basics of simple set theory, right? There are simple set theory. Using just simple set theory and applying more and more either restrictions or loosening restrictions, you can start to come up with, you know, group theory, category theory, uh, and, you know, multiplication, division, addition, and on and on until you come up with topology. And so my argument is you give first principles to a computer and you show it how to either restrict or loosen um, you know, the rules in different ways. And then they could come up with interesting theories at least, and then but, maybe prove them or maybe not. But what I was going to get to is that this object here, which is made of matter, say, um, it's not the properties of the matter that are relevant. It's the properties of the topological nature that I described, the intractability, the impossibility of contracting the loop to a point on the surface that's relevant to physics. For example, there are types of objects um, called uh, topological superconductors or topological insulators that um, in certain in certain um, uh, situations, they behave like microscopic donuts in, in, in a sense that you cannot, a currents cannot flow through them or currents can flow through them unimpeded. And they will behave in this way exactly without resistance or with infinite resistance, for example. And they'll behave purely quantum mechanically in a way that you could not predict unless you sort of understood that these are manifestations of something purely mathematical, not a mug, but they're math, they're manifestations of a, a purely mathematical concept. In other words, if I say to you, James, um, uh, does a triangle exist? You can think of a triangle, but if I say to you, James, what does a triangle weigh? That doesn't make any sense, right? Like, what's the weight of a triangle? You're like, what the hell is he talking about? Like, a triangle of what? No, no, no. What does a triangle weigh? You're like, what, what the hell is he saying? Like, he's an idiot. No. But that's like, that's getting more close to the core of why math is so useful to physics. But then all of a sudden you map on this whole architecture, this whole depth, this whole richness of math, the swagger of mathematics gets mapped onto a physics problem. Only, I think, only a, math, a mathematical physicist, a human brain 
can conceive of such things. And in other words, you wouldn't be able, a computer just seeing millions and millions of, of equations and data sets of, of parabolas and and even even like coffee cup, like it would never guess that. Oh, actually, you know this this current can be modeled as a as a as a uh, topological uh, superconductor. And then I can say, hmm, what if what if I then had a two-handled mug. You ever seen those two-handled mugs? Uh -huh. uh, actually, Jews use those on Friday nights to wash their hands. You know, oh, and then a pretzel looks like, and, and then they go through all these machinations, and then those have different properties under uh, certain temperature conditions. And then what if, like, space and time behave like this? Uh, now, uh, one of my counterexamples is that, well, these laws have been known, and computers have been pretty powerful for a long time. And, yeah, they'll, they can get, like, Newton's laws, but but the question is how much do you have to put in? And and I always say, like, you know, they're like, oh, it derived all it classified like 80 billion galaxies in uh in 30 uh, milliseconds. And I'm like, that's great. Did you also account for the six and a half years of the PhD training it took to train the algorithm? <laughs> like, is that part of the 30 milliseconds? Yeah, I agree. No, After yeah, uh, you're you're right. Like, that's like the problem with AI is how much can it do on its own? which mm -hmm. is when you get into something sufficiently complex, like let's say the human brain, there's no, there's no question AI is not gonna achieve some sort of singularity. It almost doesn't make any sense as a question. If you say, can a computer recognize if there's a baby crossing the road while I'm driving my self-driving car? Yes, it can easily do that. Uh, now because of the computer processing power and-, and I don't know, it's kind of funny. Every time I go on like some website, you know, CAPTCHA is asking me, like, is this a traffic light? Is this, like, our best minds are trying to recognize, like, stoplights and parking meters and crosswalks. It's like all AI is being used for is to, like, reverse the Turing test to prove that I'm, you know, not a computer. <laughs> it's like the opposite of what Alan Turing envisioned. Yeah. No, I agree. This is, AI is not intelligence. It's some sort of, it requires some sort of training on maybe in some cases billions or even trillions of examples and learn and and having those examples labeled like this is a traffic light this is not a traffic light and then it builds a a vector a traffic light has these nine characteristics and then it takes a new image and sees how closely does this image match any of the images that i've had billions of examples of in my database and then it says Oh, it most closely matches the traffic light vector, so it's a traffic light. Yeah, and so that's, what that's a cockroach all how, can do, right? That's yeah. all how AI works. The mm -hmm. beauty of like chess is that you don't need to feed it new examples. It, once it gets good enough, it plays itself and can generate a trillion examples, and each example is either won or lost. So it knows how to label winning positions versus losing positions. But mm -hmm. with something like a traffic light, it can't generate that on its own. That's why captures. You know how capture really works, and I learned this in a podcast it's not that you're training you know when it says are you a robot and it, it then tests you on all the traffic lights and if you recognize the traffic lights you're not a robot no it's not that it's it, it while you're doing the captcha it's following your cursor around the screen and it, is this a, a, a way a human moves a cursor or is this the way an ai would move a cursor and that's mm -hmm. really how it determines if you're a robot or not that's mm. why sometimes all you have to do is click i am not a robot and it knows you're not a robot because humans have a particular human way of clicking that AI can't beat. Right, yeah, and can't mimic it, exactly right. They're too good at at being imperfectly uh, uh, imperfect. Yes. So what, what do you have uh, next coming up? You said that you had done this uh, kind of like Alexander the Great. You had uh, surveyed the landscape of string theory, of loop quantum gravity, of quantum mechanics with Carlo Rovelli. Come to a theory of everything without me cut me out of the credit smartly because you know only three people can win the Nobel Prize. So you, Michio, and Carlo are, no, no, are no. set I, for Stockholm without me. Thanks, James. No, no, we're going against Michio and, and Carlo on this. So so okay. we could you could do all the math part, the hard part. That's what I, people always say to me, hey, I have a great idea of a story. I just need you to write it and we'll <laughs> I'll give you 10% of the profits. I get and, that uh, the Nobel Prize. <laughs> So, okay, mechanics, Carlo Rovelli's theory is that the reason quantum mechanics work is because it, he basically says that every small particle is only 
information about it is only interesting relative to something else. So if you're not, if nothing is observing or interacting with an electron, which is small and basically surrounded by huge amounts of empty space, like an atom is mostly empty and the electrons are like one, one millionth part of an atom. So oh, much less than that. Yeah. Well, much less than that. So, so you could, so if anything at all interacts with that electron, that electron has a location and a speed and uh, relevant to whoever is looking at it. So like if I'm riding in a train and you're standing still and the train's passing you, we both feel like we're standing still, but, but, but the other person is moving, even though we both, but it's, but it's because we're only observing each other relative to what is the, our context is. So the reason quantum mechanics is interesting on small particles is because small particles have nothing interacting with it until you actually observe it. Mm. Almost by definition, they're so small, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're lonely. Like an electron is lonely versus the atoms in your body. It are, are, you know, they say quantum mechanics doesn't apply to objects that you could see because, mm -hmm. um, and, and nobody's really figured out why, but uh, my argument is, is because your, your, your large objects are already relative to billions of other objects, trillions of other objects, all the other atoms and electrons and so on in the same space. So that's why it doesn't seem like quantum mechanics applies to larger objects. My argument is, is that that's a unifying theory that everything still is always relative to each other. It's just that we think quantum mechanics only applies to small objects because nobody has observed these objects until we observe them. Whereas larger objects are being observed all the time. So they're, their level of interaction relative to other objects is huge. It's like infinitely larger than an electron. So we can't measure, we can't use quantum mechanics to measure all those interactions and relativities. Mm -hmm. and, so and, then, and then turning it back to where we started with inflation and kind of like self-dealing and stuff, you know, I've come to feel that string theory, you know, which purports to be a theory of everything, which unifies all the forces of nature and physics in a very mathematical uh, language that uh, is very controversial in some sense, but, you know, is called by Michio Kaku the God equation. Uh, you notice that he always, he always has to rely on, you know, kind of Einstein being unable to solve it. And then if he does solve it, then he will win a Nobel Prize as if, you know, solving it is not its own reward. But, but we'll get, we'll get uh, past that. Uh, but anyway, the string theorists, I've come to realize, James, you know what string theory is exceptional at contributing to what's that string theory string theory well, is perhaps the best theory ever devised to make contributions to string theory well uh, that that's probably true because it's it's kind of like hey let's rewrite all the rules of mathematics <laughs> yes. and let's also completely invent an entire series of even smaller particles so that every other thing can be made out of this and using our new rules of mathematics it all makes sense <laughs> You but, know, but, but, it's, but it's like, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Th think at a macro level, Einstein's theory of relativity that, you know, the speed of light is relative to who's looking at it and how fast they are moving. It's the same relativity. Well, the speed of light is fixed. Sorry. I can't, I can't let that one go. The speed no, of light my, is constant, but the, but the, but the observation of time and distance is relative to the observer. Right. So my, my perception of these things Correct. might be different from yours, even though the actual speed through space is constant, but uh, my argument is that's the same type of relativity that occurs in quantum mechanics, that um, I could only view an electron's speed and location if I'm um, in the context of how I'm observing it. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing with light. I can only measure light based on the context of how I'm observing it. Uh, I could only observe you based on the context of how I'm observing you. Now, we're all going to view you in basically the same way because you're a large set of atoms and electrons and protons and all these things. So they're already interacting with trillions of other things. So it's, uh, it's like quantum mechanics applied to larger objects that are dense has the same rules of basic quantum mechanics, but they're sort of not measurable because it, it, with quantum mechanics, it's easier. I'm only observing only one particle is being observed by one person as opposed mm. to trillions of particles being observed by everyone. So and your, your loneliness um, kind of an analogy is kind of interesting because to observe something in quantum mechanics, you have to destroy it. In other words, you let's say you're in a room and someone tells you there's a ping pong ball moving around in that room at some speed, some constant speed without friction, and they want you to measure the ping pong ball's speed and where it is. 
and you can't see it, but you have uh, you have your touch. You can sense it with your fingers. In order to measure its speed and its position, what do you have to do? You have to stop it, right? You have to you have to collapse its position. You have to freeze it in place. Then you know exactly where where it is, right? Uh, but if you do that, you lose all of its knowledge about its speed because you froze it, right? You now you know it's moving at zero speed. You know exactly where it is, so you had to stop it to do that, and you don't know exactly how fast it was moving at the instant it was stopped. Now you can also measure. Uh, how fast it's going if you kind of like approach it, you know, very slowly and come up to it and then match its speed, but then it has undefined, it's moving still and has no, no definite position. But in order to know, you can't know simultaneously at the electronic level, at the quantum level, you can't know both simultaneously at any particular moment. And well, so my argument is it's the same thing is true for large objects. It's just infinitely smaller, the level of uh, information you get from observing it because you're one among trillions observing a larger object as opposed to a lonely object like a like an electron. Yes, yes, there is, there is some certainly there is some there is some truth to that. That the point I'm trying to make in in sort of the melancholy uh, melancholy analogy is that to measure it is almost to destroy it. And you're saying that also applies. And the macroscopic world, which is even more depressing, or uh, if you like, <laughs> and the ultimate, the ultimate end is, is of course, you know exactly where you are, and you're not moving anymore. When you have no more energy, and you have maybe uh, gotten to the end of end of life, and uh, I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, you know, kind of been ruminating on that, perhaps more more than I should. But I want to ask you, James. Well, you were approaching we, the age of fifty, so I you know, know half it's, a century. It's, I know it's it's natural to think about it. You know, it's kind of the the back nine, but but uh, but but definitely thinking about uh, you know big picture things, and I want to thank you for inspiring me to to really up my game. Now I've got uh, got sponsors. I've got sponsored by uh, really? Smirnoff vodka. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm sponsored. I <laughs> uh, got uh, got some good sponsors, and and uh, but I'm not I'm not doing it for the sponsors, as I said. You know, it's really to to do it to up to be more professional, and that's that's what you said to me a long time ago. You were like, there, you know, you can have a sponsor. But that's to really show that you're worthy of having a sponsor, and and to and to really up up the game of of your craft as a podcaster. And the only thing I feel guilty with, and maybe to close on this note, you know, for the Into the Impossible podcast, Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube, James Altucher's show, and James Altucher on YouTube. Although lately it's it's mostly a, a lot of uh, uh, chess streaming, which I like. But um, but I, we got to up your YouTube game a little bit. Noah would be uh, would be uh, would be uh, upset if we don't up your YouTube although, game. Although so. Noah's a good chess player too, so you never he know. He is. He is. <laughs> Actually, he introduced me to a very good friend of mine here in San Diego, and he and I he he destroys me in chess on a weekly basis. Uh, but I wanted to say that um, yeah. So I've been I've been trying to kind of um, you know not not to be you know. A professional, you know, podcaster. That's not my job. My job is uh, to be a professor at UC San Diego, to co-run the Simons Observatory, to look back to the beginning of time, maybe to write some books. But I have been making this case lately that as a public employee, as anyone supported in the scientific field in America, at some point he or she was supported by the by the taxpayers, and I feel like it's almost like my moral obligation to give back. And I've been doing that with videos, with long form interviews. But now I'm kind of like. I should use my unfair advantage. You know, like I'm at this top university. We've got like this awesome film studio. We have a green screen. We've got a camera crew. And it's all thanks to, you know, this, 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 you know, wonderful setup that we have. And now I can make like educational videos. So I'm doing one on my channel, Dr. Brian Keating on, I did one on, um, on uh, my channel this week with Delilah Gates, Dr. Delilah Gates. She's the second ever African-American woman to get a PhD from Harvard University in physics. It's unbelievable. She is so brilliant, James. Uh, you're going to be blown away. I want, I want everybody to check out this video on Dr. Brian Keating. Um, remember where you saw her? She's going to be, she's just like, I'm so lucky I got her when I did. But we I added in all these it. animations, and it's like everything you wanted to know about black holes, but you were scared to ask. And she's so charming, so disarming, and so brilliant. Uh, the stuff that she works on, I have trouble wrestling. I'm just a simple experimentalist. Um, and we're going to have uh, even more stuff like this. So people let me know what you think about it. Uh, it's, it's linked in my pinned tweet on Twitter. But also, um, we're doing more. I'm doing some, I'm going to do kind of a battle royale between the kind of rival theories of everything. Eric Weinstein, Carlo Rovelli, Michio Kaku, 
um, and go deep and try to figure out, you know, what, what is going on with these theorists? Why are we talking so much about the God equation, God particle, uh, the mind of God, Stephen Hawking, the big, you know, all these big questions? Because, you know, my dream, James, is now I want to start the, the, the free university, you know, that you wish you went to that only thinks about the biggest picture questions in life and that you graduate with no student loan debt and, uh, and you can attend in your pajamas. And, uh, and I said that to my son, one of my sons, uh, who's named after my late father. And, uh, and he said, um, Dada, that's redundant. You know, like you said, it's a free university. So of course you graduate without tuition. And, you know, so I put him in timeout. You know, he's still, he's still there as we speak. You know, it's like <laughs> these like... kids. You know. well, anyway, what, James, what, I want to thank you picture, so much. Say what's again? Another big picture, what's another big picture issue you would uh, teach at this university? So, okay, a theory of everything in, according to physics. What's another big picture issue? I want people to know that there's more than just the theoretical physics approach to things. People get intimidated by the Einstein factor. I call it the Einstein. You know, people say, I'm no Einstein. Well, uh, Jim Gates, who's Delilah Gates' father, who's the Ford Foundation professor at Brown University. Okay, so she had some unfair advantages, maybe, <laughs> that her father's a super genius. He's the president of the American Physical Society. Uh, he's one of my best friends and mentors. Um, you know, he wrote a book, Proving Einstein Right, and he'd be a great guest, by the way, for you. Hmm. But he, um, he said Einstein wasn't always Einstein. And in fact, one of the, uh, the, the person, the Nobel laureate, who's writing the foreword, the backward to James Altucher's foreword and think like a Nobel Prize winner. Barry said to me when he accepted his Nobel Prize in front of the King of Sweden, you have to sign this ledger, this logbook. And he looked through the logbook because he's a curious man. And he looked through the logbook and he saw the signatures of past laureates. And he looked back and he saw Richard Feynman and he saw Enrico Fermi wow. and he saw Albert Einstein. And he froze in his tracks and he said, I'm not worthy. And I said to him, Barry, come on. You know, Einstein talked openly about how he felt the imposter syndrome when it came to Isaac Newton. He said, no man had done more for culture. And I quote this in the book, and you'll read it, uh, hopefully when you get to, around to writing your foreword, James. But he said, no man has done more for culture, not, not physics, James, for culture than Isaac Newton. And then finally, James, guess what? What's, what's the next thing? So I, uh, Barry Barish uh, had imposter syndrome over Einstein. Einstein had imposter syndrome over Isaac Newton, what's the next question you would ask? I have, I, I, writing the forward of your book, I have imposter no. syndrome with Barry Barish. No, no, no. Well, okay, That's fine. That's true. <laughs> who else? Okay, fine. But who else uh, Who else would you ask about the imposter? Who, who did uh, Newton have uh, uh, imposter syndrome for? Well, probably Galileo. Well, not only Galileo. Think earlier than Copernicus. that. Copernicus. No. Aristotle. No. No, uh, uh, later than Aristotle. After uh, Aristotle, but before Galileo, before Copernicus. I don't know. Uh, sometimes considered a scientist, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, Jesus was a scientist because it was, it, it, it's, you know, the study of the mind and the soul and, and, and me, the existence, you know, starts with religion. And as you pointed out, he gave his life as a ransom for many. You taught that. And, uh, and he, he has done many, he did experiments. The, 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 the Bible, New Testament talks about the experiments that he did uh, to prove things. And uh, the, 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 the Talmud speaks about him. Uh, and, uh, and, and also the nature of proof was very interesting with him. Like, yes. you know, there's the whole story of the doubting Thomas. Like, yes. what, does, what does proof mean? when someone is a skeptic. And without him, we wouldn't have one of the fathers of the scientific method and inquiry, uh, Thomas Aquinas. It's always funny to have two, you know, kind of, you know, devout or practicing or curious Jews talk so lovingly and glowingly about Jesus Christ. I always think that's a great a way. A fellow Jew. A fellow Jew and on the uh, eve of Shabbat. And so with that, I think maybe we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. But I am interested, James, in what I want to do in addition to getting this book out. And thanks to you, I think like a Nobel Prize. It should be up on Amazon later this month for pre-order. comes out in September for my 50th birthday. I hope people will get it. Uh, by the time this podcast goes up, maybe it'll be up available. But please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Dr. Brian Keating, and then James's YouTube channel and his podcast. But the last thing is, um, is really, yeah, just, just to... What I, my, my tagline is like from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, ABC, but it's always be curious because oh, I yeah. think I like in my that. opening of the book, I say, um, people say, follow your passion. And this is where we started today. Don't follow your passion. F passion's like a spark, but curiosity is something different. 
curiosity. They've done studies, meditation, quitting substance abuse, quitting weight, you know, for, for people that struggle with weight loss. Um, curiosity, investigating, and, and, and why are you having these? That's a much more sustainable uh, urge. And it's unfortunate, as Barry Barra says in the foreword that he wrote, that we have this notion, curiosity killed the cat. It's a negative thing. No, curiosity is one of the most powerful positive forces in the known universe because with it, you can actually launch something that's much more sustainable than the spark that is passion. That's great, but you need curiosity to maintain the rocket ride to the multiverse. I love that. ABC. Always be curious. That's a tagline on my YouTube channel. So check it out, Dr. Brian Keating. James, we love you. I hope I will see you. And someday we'll finish up the how the universe got started. Yeah, we only we, have a few uh, more theories, but I want you to work on my uh, theory, real theory of quantum relativity. That's what we're going to call it. <laughs> That's right. We got to get it together. And uh, yeah, the Nobel Prizes are coming up soon. Thank you, James. This has been awesome. Thank you, Brian. I'll see All you right. soon. All right. See you soon. Bye. Bye. In Tresto, Sucubitril Valsartan Tablets is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over one million people with heart failure. It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran. Or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help.